welcome to Moments with Marianne. This is your host, Marianne Pastana. And we're here today with special guest, Jessica Dennehy, who's here to share with us her new book, Selfish is a Superpower. We often hear about being selfish as something that's negative, but what if it's something that can really empower our lives? Today, Jessica is here to share with us just that. So Jessica Dennehy is a best-selling author, journalist, speaker, and entrepreneur best known for her inspiring work in helping individuals find success and happiness by putting themselves first. As a former Wall Street regulator, Jessica started her entrepreneurial journey 11 years ago when she opened a brand of luxury barbershops called Mad Men. She's the renowned author of the number one bestseller, Pivot and Slay, The Ultimate Guide to Mindset. And through her company, Pivot and Slay Consulting, she offers career concierge services that empower entrepreneurs to get selfish and step into their power. Through her one-on-one mentoring, she helps clients create an aligned life that includes massive business growth and personal success. So let's welcome to the show. Jessica Dennehy. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Oh my goodness. What an honor it is to have you here and to talk about this book. I know you're a best-selling author. What inspired you to write this book? Oh, this book was my heart and soul, I have to say, because what I realized is throughout my career, I've kind of always put myself last. And there came this moment in time in 2020 where I was faced with a really great business opportunity and I had to choose whether I was going to continue to take my kids and put them, their happiness and their stuff before me, or if I was going to take a chance on me. And it was a really pivotal moment in my life. And I got through it now, getting through it and seeing the other side of it. I learned so many lessons and I thought, If I hadn't done that, if I hadn't put myself before them for that moment in time, I would have never created this amazing, happy life that I've created for the three of us. And other parents need to hear this because we go around thinking if we put ourselves last, that will make our kids the happiest. That will show them how much we care. That will create this life. And it's actually the opposite. And I thought, I have to tell the world this story. I have to tell the world how if we use selfish as a superpower, it's actually an amazing tool that can help us elevate not just ourselves and our happiness, but our brands, our companies, our families, our relationships. How powerful is that to redefine that word for everybody and make it not something we should be ashamed of, but something we should use as a strategy? I think that's so empowering because how many parents go around going, gosh, you mm. know, I've, I've got to take my kid to soccer and then they have piano and, and all these things where basically at the end of the day, they're just kind of crawling into bed exhausted. Exactly. And what I learned over the last three years is this. I was way more physically present for my children three years ago before this pivotal moment. I was there. I was there a lot. I was at all the stuff. I was at all the pickups, all the drop-offs, all the activities, but I was blah. I wasn't my happy, blissful self. So was I there more frequently? Yes. But the time I was spending wasn't as impactful as it is now. I was actually, and I think a lot of us are doing this unintentionally, by continuously putting ourselves last and calling it selflessness and feeling proud of that, what we're actually doing is showing our children that even though we say, go for your dreams, go live a happy life, go build a life that lights you up. We're showing them the exact opposite. And we all know kids, they're not going to listen to what we say. They are going to do what we do. They're going to mimic the actions that we take each and every day. So by putting ourselves last all the time, we're actually showing our kids that when they grow up, that's what they should do. They should just put themselves last. They should be semi-happy And that's the life that they should create. And that's absolutely the opposite of what I personally want to teach my children. And I think a lot of parents feel that way too, but they don't know how to show them anything else because we are living a world that tells us 
doing things for ourselves is wrong. It's selfish. It's bad, right? So I'm trying to redefine that word for people so they know it's just another tool that we have. The same way that being selfish all the time is a terrible thing, obviously. We don't want to always be selfish. We want to use it strategically. But in the same breath, being selfless all the time is also bad. Like too much of these things, these polarities is not good. We need to find some kind of harmony between the two where we get to explore ourselves as an individual. And for a really long time, I got caught up in the roles that I play. If you asked me, who is Jessica? I would be like, I'm a mom. I'm a business owner. I'm a lawyer. That's not who I am. That's not Jessica. Those are the roles that I play in life. And they all come together to form who I am. But I was so lost, I couldn't even identify myself outside of that terminology. And so getting selfish and using it as a superpower for me was really connecting with who I am as a human being. Because guess what? My kids, one day they're going to have their own lives. And I have to be able to come to the table and create a life that makes me happy regardless of whether they're with me or they're not. And as they evolve, I can evolve too. And that's part of the reason that I think parents get more miserable as the kids get older is because they're losing their purpose as their kids need them less. So I'm really trying to create a life right now that is multidimensional and caters to each part of myself and not just the roles that I'm playing in life. It seems that we're stuck in a very old model in how to operate with our children, and it's time to find something like what you teach that brings us more into balance. I think this is not just for parents, by the way. Like if people are listening out there and you're like, I'm not a parent, this doesn't apply, you're wrong. Because think about this. If you're living a life that doesn't make you happy, how are you showing up to your friendships? How are you showing up as a to your parents? How are you showing up to your siblings? How are you showing up to your spouse or your partner? The happier you are, the more energy and enthusiasm you bring to each of those roles in your life. And we're, we kind of have fell into the trap that I'm talking about, which is like our parents told us to go out and be happy, but they were being martyrs. And so now we're consequently being martyrs too. (laughs) And we need to break the cycle and kind of get out of that mentality. And the way that we can do this is by just remembering that we're human. You know, we we do have hopes and dreams and likes and dislikes, and we need to start tapping into those. And some of the best ways to get more successful in business and life is to remember how you used to be as a kid when you were like kind of carefree, you know, like you're carefree and you're like, woohoo, life is great. Everything's awesome. You didn't have a lot of responsibility. I try to recreate that energy in my life every day, even if it's just for 20 minutes. Like I do something fun every day for myself. Now that can be like on Wednesday nights, I play volleyball like I used to when I was younger. Uh, Or it could be something simple as like, I took a break and sat outside, took a walk, did some yoga, did some stretching. It can be something simple, but something that creates that joy each and every day. So you remember like to tap into that blissful energy that you used to have before you had all the responsibility. It seems there are a lot of people who cringe when they hear the word selfish and you talk about redefining that. So how do we go about doing that? I think the reason that a lot of people have a hard time with it is because of the societal pressure that we feel to make sure that we impact the world and not just our own little universe. And I agree with that sentiment. Like we shouldn't just be living and breathing for ourselves every single day. Like we need to include the greater good, our families, et cetera. So I think when I talk about redefining selfish, I want people to see it as just another tool that we have. If you're not happy with your life, guess what? Get a little selfish and figure out what it is you want and how you can make that happen. One of the reasons that you're not able to be selfish, at least for me, I'll talk about myself because this really was something that happened naturally for me. Around 2016 is the first time I started to dip my toe into this because I was going through a divorce. And when you're going through something, through something really significant in your life, it's really, really hard to parent at the same time because you're having all these overwhelming emotions and it's hard to be there for other people. And so what I realized in that moment was like, holy cow, I really got to take care of myself because 
the less I take care of myself and push these emotions to the side, the worse of a parent I am becoming. (laughs) And so I really started to think about who I and what I was giving my time to every day because my universe shrank. You know, I became a single mom. I didn't have the same amount of time anymore because now I was doing what two parents normally do. I was doing them as one parent. And I started to think to myself, like, man, if I don't take care of myself a little bit more, I'm not going to be able to make it through this. And I don't want people to wait for that catastrophic moment in their life to come to this realization, which is why I wrote the book, because I want you guys to see that if I had been doing this the whole time, maybe I wouldn't even be divorced, right? Part of the reason I'm divorced is because I lost myself. I wasn't giving anything to myself. And so then I kind of lost, I became like a shell of a person and no one wants to be married to a shell of a person. No one wants to be friends with a shell of a person, right? We're looking for people who are vibrant, who are energetic, who are interesting. And you cannot be interesting if all you do is parent or all you do is work and, or all you do is sit in front of the TV, right? You're interesting because you're out in the world experiencing things and contributing to the world. That's what makes someone interesting. And that's also what makes us happy because we want to feel like we are significant. And so in order to be the most significant I could be, I really had to start finding out who I was again, because I didn't know I had become stuck in that trap of having young kids and doing everything for them and not really tapping into me. Um, So I want people to see like, you can use selfish you can use it as a tool. It, it can happen every day. And that doesn't make you a bad person just because you're trying to make yourself feel fulfilled. It's actually a beautiful thing. And over the course of the last three years, the more selfish I got, guess what? I got closer with my kids than ever before. Because when I show up to parent, I am excited. I'm like, this is my time with my kids. Let's go do something fun. Let's hang out. Let's talk no electronics. Let's have a conversation. What's going on in your life? I have the brain power and the energy to really draw out that amazing connection that all of us want with our kids, but we're too distracted or depressed to have. And so the more happy you are, the more you'll be able to make the connection that I know you're seeking with the people that you love. And the more I did that, the happier my kids got because they got this amazing version of me. And they hadn't seen that before because before I was just blah. Now I'm blissful and they're seeing that. And they're like, hey, we like this mom. Maybe we should try and go out and do this for ourselves. And I saw them kind of transforming their own lives in in little ways because, you know, they're little. They're 11 and 8 now. Um, but in their little, uh, their little worlds, they started taking chances and pushing themselves to be happier too. And that was a really cool consequence of me getting selfish. So if you think about selfishness in that light, that it can not only make you happier, but also help people around you, especially people you really care about, that's a beautiful thing. And that will make you feel way less guilty. Well, I love how in your book, you talk about being at this point where you're waiting from some outside source to come in your life and make you happy. And I think so many of us go through that. I read something recently about this actually, and I think it's worth noting. There's a lot of chatter in your brain going on every single day. It's like the voice you hear the most is yours. So your voice matters. And I think we all know that. And people talk a lot about like affirmations and not negative thinking, but positive thinking. But listen to this. A lot of the thoughts going through our head aren't necessarily negative or positive, but they are disempowering. And so one thing I'm using to create happiness for myself, because that's what you're mentioning, like the happiness has to come from within. One thing that makes us happy is feeling like we have control and choice. But a lot of the verbiage we use every day takes away that power, for example, Today, I have to go to work at 10 o'clock for a meeting. I have to insinuates that you don't have a choice. And what happens when we feel like we don't have a choice? We feel helpless. We feel depressed. So even just a slight turn of word, such as today, I get the opportunity to go to this meeting at 10 o'clock. That is like, I choose this opportunity. 
Just saying those words out loud, it makes us feel empowered because the truth is you don't have to do anything. No one is forcing you to do anything, right? You actually choose every word out of your mouth, every action that you take every day, all day long, but we're not taking ownership of that. And so then we feel disempowered and lethargic and unmotivated just simply because of the way that we phrase things to ourselves. When I heard that, holy cow, I was blown away because I'm guilty of that too. I am guilty of that. And one thing that I've changed is the way that I talk about things I prioritize. Because listen, if we're talking about getting a little selfish, guess what? You have to become more a priority to yourself than you've been than you've been making yourself in the last couple of years. So someone will say to me, have you done X, Y, Z yet? And instead of being like, no, I haven't had a chance or I don't have the time or I hadn't had the time yet to think about it. I say, no, today I didn't choose to prioritize that. That makes me take ownership for my day. Like today I chose to go to the beach. That was my priority because I was having a rough day, a rough week, whatever, and I needed some time off. So instead of being like, I don't have the time, no, I chose to prioritize myself today and go to the beach. That is ownership. That is power. And so a lot of you guys are waiting for these external forces to make you happy. If you get the right job, if you make this amount of money, if you just had a spouse, if your kids were just X, Y, Z age. None of that's going to make you happy unless you're happy inside. And the only way to start getting happy inside is to start taking ownership of the choices that you make and make sure that the choices you're making are actually ones that help fortify your happiness. Does it take time to get to that level of awareness where we're questioning what is coming up in our heads and how to present ourselves? Yes. Oh my goodness. Yes. I mean, Just becoming aware of your thoughts is an exercise in and of itself. Like I remember having to do that. So for me, this whole process started in 2016 during my divorce. So that's a long time ago. It's like seven years ago, right? I'm not good at math. I'm not going to pretend that that might not be accurate, but you know, 2016 to 2023, that like it's taken all of that time for me to get to the point of how I feel and act now. And I'm still a work in progress. But I remember in 2016, my one and only goal was to (laughs) recognize what is happening in my head because I was anxious. I couldn't sit still for a second without bawling my eyes out. Um, I couldn't think straight. And so I forced myself to go to yoga because I had to just to focus on one thing for an hour made my head feel more clear. And that's when I started recognizing what actually was popping in my head. Like I'd be at yoga, I'd be trying to hold this really difficult pose. And all of a sudden a a thought would pop in my head and I'd be like, oh, that's why I feel so upset today because I've been replaying, uh, um, unconsciously replaying this moment in my head that led to my divorce. And so like my subconscious is replaying it over and over again. And I, I keep living in the past and that's why I'm like so distraught today. That alone, that awareness of what's happening in your head alone is going to take a lot of effort, but it is a key component in understanding who you are and what's making you tick, what's making you upset, what's making you happy. Like you need to be able to observe what's going on in your mind without judging yourself. And I think that's the hardest step to take. And also the one that takes the most time. Once you can get a little bit more aware of what's happening, the rest is going to come really easily to you because you're going to recognize right away if you're with somebody and you're like, oh, this is the most boring conversation or like, this is upsetting me. Like you're going to realize it right away and extract yourself from that. Or you're going to be like, oh, I love this person. They're giving me such great energy. I'm going to keep seeing them more. Like that's going to happen much quicker. But the first part, that's the hardest one. Because we don't realize how much there's like a whole dialogue going in in our heads all day long, which is creating anxiety inside of us. And most of us are oblivious to it. Well, I think for some people who haven't had that aha moment like you've had, it could be difficult to bring this all together and make sense of it. Yeah, I think for me, I knew that I was anxious most of my life, but I didn't really know what that meant. And I didn't know how to control it. I didn't know how to get past it. For me, it took a really catastrophic moment to have the willpower to want to do this for myself. 
I think I was like at what some may call like rock bottom. And I don't want people to have to wait. Like if my book helps one person not wait for that rock bottom moment to start trying these skills out for size, that would be a real win for me. Um, because I wish I hadn't waited that long, you know, cause I would have had these tools to get myself through that tough time. Um, but instead I, I was there, I was at the bottom, <laughs> I was struggling and I kind of just learned this as a coping me- mechanism. And I'm grateful for that struggle because I extracted a lot of lessons from that. I really felt your book, Selfish as a Superpower, allows people to learn some life skills that they otherwise maybe never be able to pick up. I think so. And I think one of the things that motivated me, that motivates me every day to talk to people on social media, because I'm really present on social media. And even with this book is like, I'm just a regular person. I'm just like a regular person living in the suburbs with my kids you know, I don't have a nanny by design. I want to be a real and significant part of my kid's life. And so maybe to hear this from someone who's just like you will make you have the confidence to go out and try it too. Because I think a lot of the self-help books or like self-development books I read are by people who are like light years ahead of me and super rich and have lots of money to pay people to do a lot of the stuff that the average person can't afford to pay someone to help them with. And so I thought I'm going to show people what it's like to be in the middle and still be able to create this for myself. I think that's powerful. And I wish I had someone that I could have resonated with in that way when I was going through this. I had to kind of find my way the hard way. So hopefully this helps someone get there faster. In your book, you share about how being selfish allows us to be the best version of ourselves. And I found that to be such a transformative statement. I think it's the most important thing. I think it's the most important thing because I want people to want to be around me. I want people to like, I want to help. I want to help the people I love. Like I want to help inspire them. I want to help get them through tough times. I want to be their sounding board. Like I love my family. I love my family. I'm super close with them. But I think for me, what I realized over the years is like, (laughs) it's quality, not quantity. I know you guys have heard that a million times, but when I didn't have the the brain power to help everyone around me, I really had to get my circle tiny. I had to be like, who am I going to give my precious time to? Oh, it's going to be the people that have a two-way street with me. You know, the people who pour into me just as much as I pour into them. And I want to give the best version of me to these people. And that motivates me every day. Like if I have a friend who's really pouring their heart and soul into me when I'm down, like I want to give that back. That's who I am. And that's who I want to be in contact with every day. So for me, when I think about like who I want to really be my best self for, A, it's me because I'm it's a great life when you're happy, you know, when you're like making your own happiness and creating your own happiness, like things are great. You're not dependent on someone else's mood or someone else's uh, reaction. You're just happy in yourself. So like if I launch my book and no, none of my friends buy it, let's say I'm not upset about it. Cause I'm doing this for me. I'm, you know, I'm launching the book for me. I'm happy with it. I know it's going to touch people. I'm confident in it and no one else's reaction to it matters. That's powerful. And so I think about like who I want to, I really thought and sat with myself, like who do I want to pour into the most? And I shrunk my circle by a lot because you only have so much energy and time to give. So you better start being really methodical and intentional about who you give that time to. And I think that's kind of a pitfall of a lot of people who get lost is we're trying to give our time to the wrong people. You know, people that don't really care, people who are not going to really be there for us when we need them. The sooner you look around and see who's in your circle, this and who is really um, an impactful person to you, I think the easier it is to get happy because then your circle is the right the right people, the right fit, the right impact, the right energy level, the right enthusiasm, the you know, like positivity. And I think that's an important part of getting selfish is kind of 
letting go of those people who are not serving you and not feeling guilty about it. I think that's so powerful. I mean, how often do we take inventory of the people around us? Yeah, for me, that moment didn't come until COVID. <laughs> so we're, this is recent, like three years ago. The moment I talk about in my book, Selfish as a Superpower, is really about this moment in time where my businesses were shut down because of COVID. I own a couple of barbershops. We weren't allowed to have and have them open. And money was just flying out the door, right? Like trying to make sure that we stay relevant while the shops are closed, trying to make sure we have enough money to bring everybody back. We don't lose our space. You know, we don't lose our clients. We don't lose our staff. It was hard. And at the same time, I was like, oh my God, I'm a single mom. Like I cannot be unemployed even for a couple of months. Like, no. And I just dug deep to figure out how I could make money during that time. And that took a lot of energy because I was feeling a lot of emotion, just like everybody else. Like there was a lot of moving parts. Like, did, was I going to have a, a business, the business I worked so hard for for 10 years? Was I going to lose it? Was I going to come back? Was I going to have enough money? My kids are home. Are they okay? Emotionally, how's everybody doing? Oh, we need to go do Zoom class for the kids, blah, 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 right? All the stuff that everyone was dealing with, except I also was trying to figure out how to open a new business. And all those things were happening. So I had time for nothing. Like really, I had I had no choice but to pick and choose like the five people I'd be able to talk to every day because that's all the energy I had. Before that, I had never taken an inventory of the people around me. I learned real fast who I could talk to and who I couldn't because there were just some people who they just wanted to watch the news all day and talk about all the drama and that just stressed me out and I was already stressed out enough. There were some people who I realized had been leaning on me, one-way street relationship, and now that I didn't have the time to talk about their problems nonstop, they didn't even care to talk to me anymore because I wasn't serving a purpose for them, which was mind-blowing because I'm like, I just poured into you for years and now I need you. And you're like, sorry, I can't, I can't provide what you've been providing for me the whole time. I think that moment in my life was when I really started to take an inventory of who I was spending time with. And it wasn't as hard to let people go because I had no choice. It was my back was up against the wall. I had to make money. I had to save my business and I had a parent <laughs> and everything else had to come second. So I though think it's smart for people to take a periodic inventory of who's around you because that is affecting how you think, how you deal with things and how much time you have to put into yourself and the people that you really need to focus on. I think that's such a powerful way of putting things about how we pour into other people, because don't we do that? It it hurt. I got to be honest. Like There were some relationships that I thought were more meaningful than I guess they were to the other person. I don't know. But one of the, one of the things that I've been working on throughout the years is to take the emotion out of a lot. And I don't mean be unemotional. What I mean is in order to elevate in the ways that I'm describing, it takes a certain level of non-judgmental observation. So when you're looking at your actions and what you've been doing over the last couple of years, in order to change and really change your life for the better, you have to kind of float out of your body and look at yourself objectively and be like, why am I doing that? Why am I acting like that? Why did I say that? And not to place judgment on yourself, but to be like, how could I do better next time? And now I act that way with other people too. Like there used to be things people would say that I took so personally, I took to heart. And I've realized throughout the years, like most people are floating around in their own bubble. They don't know, they're not self-aware. They don't really understand why they do things. They're not trying to understand themselves. They're just in autopilot. And most of what they say and do is not a personal attack on us. It's just because they are they don't want to turn the microscope on themselves. And once you take that personal like emotion out of it, it's really easy to move on. It's really easy to observe who really cares, who really wants to be in your, in your world for the right reasons, and who doesn't. And then to move on from the people who don't without anger and without sadness, but observing like they played a role in your life as a lesson. And now you take that lesson and you just part ways and it's okay. That 
burden is lifted off of you to have to mourn the loss of every single person, right? Like you don't have to carry that. That's something we put on ourselves. And I realized that recently. And so for me, when I observe that something is not healthy for me anymore, I can really move on with happiness and no anger or resentment. That's a very, very, very big flex. It takes a while to get there, but once you're there, man, it's so freeing and it is selfish a little bit. It is selfish because you're deciding I'm not going to just be a doormat anymore. If we are in a relationship, whether that's a friendship, whether it's familial, whether it's romantic, if this isn't two-sided, I'm not going to accept it. I'm not. I'm not just going to be there for you all the time and never get anything in return. That is not healthy for me. That doesn't make me happy. That isn't in furtherance of my own joy. And so I choose to let that go. Whoa. That is a huge moment for every person that can get there. (laughs) Oh my gosh. That's so, so big. And you've gone through so much and you, you're really just honest in your book and so well-written You talk about, oh my goodness, yes. And you talk about encouragement. What were some of the things that encouraged you or how did you find encouragement along your path? So my biggest advice here is to start small because I think a lot of times turning our life around seems like such an onerous task and we're like, oh, it's going to take forever. But remember, when you look back on your journey, it all started with one footstep, right? One step forward. So just do one thing. That's how I started. I started with one thing, right? Like what would make me happy? I'm going to, well, I don't know. I'm just going to say an example, right? Like today I'm going to work out and I'm not going to look at my phone. I'm just going to take this 45 minutes for myself. And I felt really good after that. And that feeling is what motivated me to keep going. It's that feeling of when we change something and we remove something that was actually burdening us, that feeling of freedom and happiness, like that's what's going to motivate you to keep going. So for me, it started with exercise. I was like, I'm going to, I'm pretty cranky. I can't just wake up and go straight into my three and five-year-old. Like I just can't do it, right? This is years ago. So I'm just going to wake up a little bit earlier. I'm going to have coffee, exercise and try to get my act together before they wake up. That small change, which was very small at first, like a half an hour, made me feel so good That the next day when my alarm went off and I was like, I don't feel like getting up right now. I'm like, but you'll feel good. Remember how good you felt? And so I was like, fine. So I got out of bed. (laughs) That's how it starts. And so what motivates me is the way that I feel, the way that I feel more clear headed or feel happier. I feel more fulfilled by doing the things that I love and by incorporating them into my daily routines. That's what helps me keep going. And even just this year, I made some really big dietary changes in my life. Um, I love chips. I'm like obsessed with chips, especially Doritos. And I gave them up. April 1st, I was like feeling like garbage. And I'm like, you know what? What do I do every day that's not healthy? I eat chips every day, like every single day. Maybe if I take them away, maybe I'll feel a little bit better. And so like the first day I did it, I kind of did feel better. Like I felt more hydrated and I'm like, all right, I see this tiny, tiny change. Let me just keep going. And so that motivated me every day when I looked at the bag of Doritos, because I still had them for my kids. I'm like, Jessica, don't do it. You're not going to feel that great. Like you're feeling really good. Just keep going. Let's see how long you can do it. Right. That was April 1st and today is August 17th and I still haven't had any chips. So The motivation for me is the way I feel. And that can be physical, that can be with your happiness level, that could be energetically, you know, you just feel like you're more enthusiastic. That's what keeps me going, every change I make. Um, And then it just compounds, right? We're talking about one step. We started with one step. So then you add to that, right? I started waking up an hour earlier. Then I started incorporating meditation. Then I started incorporating reading every day. Then I started incorporating, I don't know, a a daily dose of fun where I like go out and do something fun, like I said, each and every day. 
all of these small changes over time, over years, added up to who I am and what I do now. It's it's definitely a marathon. It's not a sprint. So start with something tiny and and let your feelings like motivate you to keep going. And then then the best part is that not only are you happier, but other people start to notice like, oh my God, your skin looks so much, like so much different. Like you look younger. What's going on with you? Or you seem really happy lately. Like what's going on in your life that you're so happy? Or your kids are like laughing more or your spouse feels more connected to you, right? Like you'll start to see the changes you're making in your own little body. You'll start to see the ripple effect of how they are affecting the people around you and how the other people are noticing. And then I started to see my parents who are old school Italians, eat pasta seven days a week, are like, wow, yeah, I see how happy you are. Like maybe, maybe I should drink more water. I'm like, yeah, you should drink more water. You know, let me get you this really nice, like customized water bottle to motivate you. Right. And so now they're drinking more and they're eating less pasta and they're trying to change their diets because they see how it's been affecting me. And I feel excited because that's a positive effect I'm having on people I really love. And that's all just because I'm doing something that makes my life better, that I'm having this effect on other people. It's pretty cool to watch. That is pretty awesome, especially when they're asking, how are you doing this? What what do I need to start doing? Yeah. I mean, you want to be that light for people. I think we all have that desire to have an impact like that. But we don't realize that we can't help other people if we're not helping ourselves. If you feel like garbage and you're not confident and happy and full of life, how are you going to help someone else find their happiness? How are you going to help your parents get healthier as they age? How are you going to help your kids find a healthy lifestyle or a happy lifestyle if you're not doing it? You cannot help someone do something that you haven't done to a certain degree yourself. I'm sure you're having people reevaluate what they're doing in their lives and going, I want more of what she's got. Yeah. And I think the thing that sets me apart too on online anyway, like on my socials, I think one of the people, the reasons people really like tuning in is because I'm going to show you the full spectrum. We're not just here for the wins. Like I am very raw and real in my books and on my social media. Like you will see me without makeup when I first wake up with my hair crazy, trying to work out. I'm going to tell you, I don't feel like doing this today. I feel like going, eating a bag of chips and sitting in front of my TV. Now, whether I do or not, I post about it. If I mess up, I post about it. If I feel like crap, I post about it. Uh, when I'm winning, I post about that too. But I I post the lessons, I post the struggles, I post myself all dolled up, and I post myself in my workout clothes with no makeup on. Like you're gonna see the full spectrum, you're gonna hear it all. I'm not gonna hide it because I want people to see. I feel like you do too. I don't wake up just feeling spectacularly happy and and, and you know vibrant every day. Like I have bad days too. I have struggles. I mess up. I yell at my kids sometimes. I post about that. I feel guilty even just this morning. Like I have been recovering from a concussion. I woke up today feeling a little foggy and my kids were giving me a hard time getting to camp. And I finally was just like, get in the car. (laughs) Like enough. Come on. I don't feel good. And I dropped them off. Like we, not that we fought, but like, I was like, I love you guys. I'm sorry. I was cranky, but I spent the whole car ride home feeling guilty about that. But what do I really have to feel guilty about? Like I'm human and I had a bad morning. Like there's really no guilt in that, but we make everything a big deal in our brain. And I want to share that. Like I struggled this morning. There's no shame in that. And I think that's why people in really can try to do what I do and try to like, ask, like, ask me like, what, what can I do to change this? Like, how can I do more of like what you do? Because they see that I'm just a regular person. Like I'm, I'm struggling just like them. And I think sharing that gives them the courage to ask the question or try the thing. And I, I I think that's a big win for all of us. I would agree. I would agree. I know that sometimes granting ourselves permission to start making these steps can be such a difficult thing. 
How would you suggest that people at least start doing that? Yeah, that's the hardest part is doing it without feeling the guilt. So I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Like you're going to feel guilty at first because it's just retraining yourself to think a certain way. I don't think the guilt falls off until you start to see a result of some sort. And so don't expect that to happen like instantly. We don't see results instantly. We know that, but we still expect them. (laughs) I don't know why we do that to ourselves. Um, So my suggestion to you is pick one thing, pick one way that you can maybe implement this, like a little version of selfishness every single day and stick with it for a couple of weeks. See how you feel, see what starts to happen with the people around you. But just every day, wake up and grant yourself permission to do that one thing. You have to be able to do that. You have to every day, wake up and be like, it's okay that today you're going to blah, blah, blah. It's okay. It's okay. And it's okay if so-and-so doesn't like it. And it's okay if this affects blah, blah, blah that you normally do. But I, I give myself permission anyway. You actually have to say that to yourself. At least I did. I had to say it every day until I believed it. <laughs> so, and then once everyone is starts to adjust, because people don't like change. So like, there's going to be people when you get selfish that are going to point it out and they're going to be giving you a little dig or trying to make you feel guilty. You, you, you will only feel guilty if you allow them to make you feel guilty. If you allow yourself to feel guilty, you're granting permission. So you have the power. Remember, we went back to self-talk. You have the power to not allow anyone else to make you feel guilty. You have the power to wake up every day and not feel guilty. It's a choice. You choose to not feel guilty for this one little tiny thing you're doing for yourself every day. A little tiny thing. Just a little tiny thing. Okay? Talk to yourself. I know it sounds crazy, but do it. Once you start doing it out loud, eventually you won't have to. Eventually it's just going to come more naturally, but you got to form the habit. And I think they say a habit takes like 90 days to form. So you're in it for the long haul, guys. Choose this one thing and do it for 90 days. Where do you think people get hung up the most? Consistency. I think it's really hard for people to be consistent. And the funny thing is, (laughs) it's actually ironic. Most people, especially entrepreneurs, I find the hardest part of being an entrepreneur is for people to stay consistent and do things before they see the results because we all want instant gratification. I actually had the opposite experience. I was so consistent, I became neurotic. I was so wedded to my routine. I was rigid. I didn't know how to go with the flow. And so part of my journey has been to allow myself some ebb and flow, to allow myself permission to say, I don't feel like this today. I don't, I don't have to stay wedded to this strict, rigid um, formula of life. And the more I kind of went with the flow, the more happy coincidences started to appear and opportunities that I wouldn't have had if I had rigidly stuck to everything. So we all have our own journey in that way. But I think for the most part, people have a hard time staying consistent. And so that's why I'm saying the first 90 days or so, you're going to have to force yourself into it. It's like rewiring your brain to allow yourself to have this time. Um, And I think once you get in the rhythm of it, you know, and you force yourself, if you give yourself a 90 day time limit, I bet by the end of 90 days, you're just going to be doing it automatically. And that's what's going to make it easier for you. And that's why I said, just start with one thing. If you're having the opposite problem, like I had of being so rigid, you're controlling and neurotic, then um, my advice to those people is to one day do what you feel like doing. How about that? Like wake up and listen to your body. Listen to what it's telling you. You feel like you need to let out some energy, go for a run. You feel like you need to rest, rest. Try to practice being in the moment and feeling what you feel and allowing it. You know, there's two different kinds of people. The ones who are like so rigid, they have to control everything, which is absurd. 
because you can't control half of life. You can only control what you can control, right? And then there's the people who are just like, la, 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 la. I'm just going to live in the moment. And they don't, they don't ever have that consistent um, stamina to really make the change because changes take stamina. You know, you've got to stick with it for a little bit before you'll start to see any positive results. I think that answers the question for both kinds of people. <laughs> <laughs> well, and how about clarity? Because I know clarity is such a big deal. So how do we get to this point where we develop a sense of clarity that serves us as we're making these changes? You make time to think. It's crazy. In my consulting business, I tell people this all the time. I'm like, you need to think. You need time to think every day. What does that mean for me? I sit in the quiet every single day for like 10 or 15 minutes. And I write out, you know, my thoughts as I sit there. Like if a thought comes into my brain, I write it down because you can't have clarity if you're always going, 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 going. The clarity comes when you're quiet. That's why when you lay in bed at night, your mind is racing with all the thoughts because you're finally quiet. Now imagine if that was actually productive time instead of anxiety ridden, you know, word vomit coming through your brain. Imagine if you can actually harness that time to let your mind be still and allow those thoughts to come up. That's really why meditation is so important, but I know that word scares a lot of people and I felt that way too at first. So instead I would just sit in the quiet and it's hard. Like I would sit outside in the morning, like around sunrise because the world is kind of quiet. Like there's not a lot of cars, not a lot of activity, not my phone going off. And I would just like sit there and listen to the birds and try to fit. Like I wasn't meditating, but I was just at least like recognizing like what was going on in my head. What was I worrying about? What was, you know, what were my thoughts going towards work, towards family, you know, dreaming about vacation? Like what was going on in there? Clarity is going to come in those quiet moments. And now I make now years later, okay, years, right? It took baby steps to get where I am. One, once or twice a year, I go away for a weekend alone just to think. I go with my journals and I go to a quiet, like beachy place. I went to Sedona for a couple of days and I went to the beach for a couple of days, like six months later. And I just kind of like have a quiet weekend where I'm not on my phone a lot. I'm not watching TV. I'm just like at the beach thinking and observing and like letting my mind go where it goes without having a plan. And that think time brings a tremendous amount of clarity. And again, just start small, like 10 minutes in the morning, maybe 10 minutes before you go to sleep. Um, do what works for you. It doesn't have to be a certain time of the day. It doesn't have to be a certain, you know, regimented thing. Know yourself and let, like, kind of let it happen naturally. Well, it's interesting. When we talk about meditation, there's so much um, different ways that we can approach that. And one that stuck kind of with me in your book was when you talked about just sweeping in between barber chairs and how therapeutic that is. I mean, some people meditate as they're walking or they're eating. It could, it doesn't mean that you have to really sit, right? No, actually you're bringing up a great point. One way is I know a lot of people that are into self-development exercise. One great way to do like a meditation while you're moving around is to not listen to any music or television or audiobooks or podcasts while you're doing your cardio or lifting. That time when you're only focused on one singular thing, that's a form of meditation, right? You're running. If all you're doing is running and you're not listening to anything else, you're not looking at anything, you're just like thinking, that's meditation. If you're lifting at the gym and you're not, you don't have any ear pods in or anything, that's meditation. Like use that time to think while you're exercising. It's a beautiful, beautiful time. So many things come to me while I'm doing my cardio in the morning. Like I actually started to keep a notepad next to my, my exercise, like elliptical machine, because so many things come to me because my brain is so clear as I focus on just one thing. My goodness, Jessica. I mean, we could talk forever. I found your book, Selfish is a Superpower, to be so impactful where can our listeners connect with you and be part of your community and learn more about your work? 
Well, I'm present on all the social media sites at the Jessica Dennehy. I'm most active on Instagram. Um, and you can go to my website, jessicadennehy.com. You can buy the book there. You can buy it on Barnes and Noble. It's on my link in bio on all my social media sites, and I'm constantly posting about it. So please follow me, interact with me, send me a DM. I love speaking to my readers. I'll answer any questions you have. I would love to connect. Well, Jessica, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you, Jessica. It's been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new book, Selfish is a Superpower. Selfish is a Superpower is available at Amazon, and make sure to check in with your indie bookstores and place your order there too. You'll want to make sure to check out Jessica's podcast, Pivot and Slay. It is such a great show. Well, on that note, we're going to pause here for a quick break, and we'll be right back after these messages from our sponsors. The first thing you need to know about me is that I love my kids, but they are not my everything. They used to be, but that's when my entire life fell apart. In order to pick back up the pieces, I had to put the love I have for myself before everything else, including my kids. I'm Jessica Dennehy, and I own multiple businesses. I'm a best-selling author, and I have all the strategies that I've used to make my life what it is today. And I'm going to teach you how to do them in my new book, Selfish is a Superpower. So go get your copy today on Barnes & Noble or jessicadennehy.com. Announcing a revolutionary tool for wellness. Scalar Light has the ability to enhance and harmonize your own bio energies. With Scalar Light, you can get started in just minutes and begin feeling better the very next day. Scalar Light is a remote energy that gently and subtly works with your own body's bio energies, increases pro cellular wellness, and enhances your body's immunity. Experience the benefits of Scalar Light. Try a complimentary 15 day experience at scalarlight.com. Are you ready to celebrate World Wellness Weekend on September 15, 16, and 17? Well, we are. 6,000 venues in 147 countries are organizing fun and free activities for you to enjoy with your friends, your family, your colleagues. Look on wellmap.org, W-E-L-L-M-A-P. In your hands lie ancestral patterns. These patterns shape how you think, what you struggle with, and experiences you love, your life pattern. We are going into the latest neuroscience of biological hand analysis, a realm beyond palmistry where science and the soul entwine. Hand analysis is the latest method to transform lifelong patterns. I am Master Hand Analyst Brent Bruning. Join us and visit thepowerinyourhands.com. Looking for a page turner? Cozy up to a fantasy adventure romance trilogy with The Girl in the Twall Wallpaper by Mary Kay Savaris. The second novel in the Star Writers trilogy, The Star Writers Club, is coming soon. Take the journey. Connect with Mary at www.marykaysavaris.com. Her books are available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie bookstores. With Breath Hub, you'll experience the transformative power of breath as it harmonizes your body, mind, and spirit. Recommended by experts in fitness, sports, psychology, and medicine. Meet the scientific way of being well. Breath Hub. Breathe better. Live better. Pandemonium. Fast forward 20 years. A U.S. president seizes control of all U.S. missiles, the power grid, the banking system, and every computer in America as he hides in an underground bunker. Pandemonium, a captivating sci-fi thriller where a hidden war, psychics, aliens, artificial intelligence, and transcendental love collide with the latest media technology. Pandemonium, live to all devices. Get your copy on paperback or digital. Free sample at GetPsychic.org. I'd like to thank Jason Eastwood at Guitarfulness for sharing his inspiring music and talent with us. His music is known worldwide for cultivating atmospheres of harmony, 
inner peace, and clarity. Visit Jason's website at guitarfulness.com. Join his newsletter, be part of his community, and download his music. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne, where we make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work, and while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.